Hello, this is Professor David Bishai, and I'm here with a lecture on the demand for health presenting the details of the Grossman model. This lecture comes in three parts. Part one will discuss the basic elements of the Grossman model of the demand for health. Part two will use the model to try to understand what affects the level of uh, demand for health and why, and we'll discover that some of the main determinants of the demand for health are wages, education, age, and a few other things. And in part three, we'll discuss the limitations of the Grossman model. Uh, I've had some help putting together this lecture. I'm indebted to my colleague John Bridges, to Michael Grossman himself, and to Paul Dolan for the materials that they've supplied for this lecture. So let's get on with part one of the lecture. What we're going to cover today in the Grossman model is the difference between the demand for health and the demand for health care. Since health is something that people want, we'll briefly talk about why they want it. The basic model will show us the effects of wages and the effects of the time horizon on the demand for health. And we have to separate the Grossman model every time we use it into two versions. Uh, one version is called the investment model of the demand for health, in which one wants to be healthy because it uh, is an investment in productivity of the worker. And the other model is the consumption model in which one wants to be healthy because it it itself makes all of the other things you're consuming much more enjoyable. It's better to drink Coca-Cola when you're healthy than to drink Coca-Cola when you have a fever or a bad headache. It's just a better product. Everything you do, going sailing, listening to music, and putting on your shirt, it all feels better when you're healthy and so one wants to be healthy in order to enjoy consumption of products with much more utility. So let's go to the general background of the what we're going to see in the Grossman model. We know going into the Grossman model and into this lecture that health is indeed affected and in a sense produced by many factors. It's produced by our genetics, our social class, where we work, our employment, wealth and housing. We know that things that we do, uh, going to school, whether we smoke or use drugs, diet, health care, utilization, and lifestyle, these are choices that we make, and they affect our health, too. That gives me control of how healthy I am. Uh, other things I really don't have direct control over, which is the sanitation of my community, whether the grocery store sells me safe food or tells the truth about the safety of the food, the water, the safety of the streets, the information available to me to protect my health, whether uh, cocaine is extremely expensive or dirt cheap in my neighborhood. These are things that will affect my health regardless of my uh, ability to make good choices. So economists love to model production choices. And if you look at that, of these above health determinants, you know, which ones do I get to choose? Obviously, the ones in the middle, education, smoking, and drug use. I get a little bit of choice in my work environment and housing, but those are long-term decisions. Uh, so a lot of the choices I control, but not all of them. This is a, a microeconomic model. We are only going to focus on the choices made by an individual, and we're just going to ignore all of the choices that other people make that affect our health. So why do we need a model of health demand? One of the market failures is that health is an underprovided altruistic public good. We have to understand why it's a good and why people who don't achieve health in their life, why do we care about them? What are we actually denying them? We are concerned about inequalities in health. And if these inequalities are caused by the basic demand for health and strategies to improve health might undo themselves. So there's a famous saying about people who are newly covered with Obamacare, like they were newly covered with Medicaid in the Oregon experiment. More Obamacare? Yes, and I'll have fries with that, uh, meaning that I'll, that I've got health insurance, I can take more risks and abuse my health because obviously the doctor can clean out my coronary artery disease if I do clog up my arteries. So this strain of thinking about um, microeconomics of household choices comes from a, a Nobel Prize winning economist named Gary Becker. He really revolutionized all of economics by asking uh, questions about households as producers of goods. Before Becker, only firms produced stuff. After Becker, households produced cooked food and clean houses and domestic services. Uh, and households now produce health. 
So households are little factories. They buy market goods and they combine them with time to produce commodities. So here's an analogy. Uh, good is to commodity as bed is to sleep, as TV is to amusement. So we, we buy the good of a bed in order to produce what we really want, which is sleep. And as a household factory, the factory uses beds and our own input time, and we produce what we really care about, the commodity of sleep. I would also go out to the marketplace. I would buy a television. That's the good. And I combine it with my time to produce the commodity that I really want called amusement. Well, now you can see where we're going. The household is a firm that produces health in this model. So here's a picture of Professor Michael Grossman. Uh, he's uh, lived his whole life and worked his whole life at the City University of New York. And even in retirement, he's still quite productive and you can still see him producing a lot of, of new and groundbreaking research. What he did was he used the Becker framework in the, the paper in the Journal of Political Economy in 1972. He was concerned with how individuals allocate their resources to produce health. The model goes beyond the traditional demand analysis, and it's been extremely influential for generations of health economists, and even the World Bank and WHO are influenced by this model. The idea is the individual is a producer of health, not simply a consumer. So our key concept is that the demand for health care is derived from a demand for health. Few people want health care for its own sake. They derive their demand for health because they want healthy days. And they're not passive consumers of health. They actively produce health. They take their time and their money and they decide how healthy to be. And the health that they produce can last over long periods of time and depreciate like capital. So you're going to see the role of capital coming in this model. So here's an isoquant version of how this model works as a production model. One takes many, many inputs. I'm only picking two of them because isoquants are two-dimensional. Uh, I can only produce health by consuming vegetables and spending time exercising. Various combinations of, of vegetables and minutes exercising can improve my uh, uh, health stock. All values here are the exact same level of the health stock. So I can either have lots of time exercising and a fair amount of vegetables, or and I'd be that healthy if I lower the number of vegetables from here in E3 to any point on E2, I would uh, reduce my amount of health. So let me go over the four quadrant diagram version of the Grossman model. I'm going to build up the four quadrants. Here they are. I've got uh, I've four different axes to talk about. I'm going to label them one by one. To the right uh, of the midline is a consumption axis where I get to eat stuff and composite consumption. We're going to think of all of the possible things that one can consume from uh, the midline to the right. The health axis goes uh, from zero to above uh, from the, the, the midline of the horizontal axis to, to up at the top of the graph, and this is how healthy I am. I have health inputs on the part of the horizontal axis left of midline, and at the bottom I have consumption. So you'll see that two of the four axes are labeled consumption, and that's a little weird, but you'll see how I'm going to be using that feature. So there's really three things graphed on four different parts of this graph. In the top left, I have a production function. I've been talking about this throughout the beginning of this lecture. And you can see here its relationship between buying more and more health inputs and how healthy I am. And the more health inputs I move left and left and left, the healthier I am. I am. And there are diminishing returns to scale. So this doesn't increase at an increasing rate uh, after I've eaten my 10th bundle of broccoli, the benefit to my health has been reduced, and so you see diminishing returns to scale. There's a budget constraint in the bottom left, and that works as follows. If you see that red line, that is a, a consumption boundary. Where that red line is hitting the horizontal axis, a place where I've spent all of my money on health inputs and I have nothing to consume. Where the red line hits the vertical axis. I spent all my money on consumption and there's no health inputs. Uh, but there are combinations of money that um, might be in the middle of the red line where I have 
some inputs to health and some consumption commodity. If you can imagine picking any point on the horizontal axis, I can plot that point and the blue line tells me how healthy I will be from those health inputs and the red line tells me how much consumption I'll still be able to have after I've bought those health inputs. If you think about it, the slope of that budget constraint is going to be related to the price of trading off a unit of, a, of an aspirin pill or a bundle of broccoli for composite consumption uh, opportunities. It will be the price. Now quadrant four is simply a mirror. This is a, a two-way mirror. Any point on the vertical axis of consumption hits this 45 degree line and reflects right back up to the same point on the horizontal axis. So no mathematics is being done here. It's just a way of moving three things onto four quadrants. So you'll see how that works soon. So just it's a way to get consumption back into uh, the, the, the top right. So finally, we have a consumption possibilities frontier, which is this brown line. And these are the opportunities that our community gives us to trade consumption for health. And as our community improves its GDP and offers us more income, the right-hand uh, intercept between the brown line and the consumption uh, horizontal axis can move to the right. GDP growth op offers opportunities to move both consumption and health further and further outward away from the origin. So you can imagine wider and wider consumption possibilities the richer we get. As so we'll go over, you can imagine things that can only possibly make you healthier but not make you any richer. Let's say we get a, a new vaccine is discovered, we can become healthier with that, but not in the short run, we won't offer an increase in GDP. Now, how do we know what to do with this model? Let's start using it. The first question will start in quadrant one with the question of how healthy do I want to be? And the way to solve that is to start plotting utility indifference curves in that top right quadrant. You say I plotted uh, two dotted ones and one solid one. Point A in this space, if you can see point A here, this is the best place that I can be. It gives me the highest utility indifference curve possible under the frontier. I can't go beyond the frontier and get to the northeast in that dotted line, and it would be stupid to stay inside the frontier. I want to get as much health and consumption as I can. So point A, the tangency between the indifference curve and the production possibility frontier is the optimal solution. And now I know how healthy I want to be and how much consumption I want to undertake this year. Well, I'm going to go from there and start asking more questions. So the four questions I can ask with this graph are first, how healthy should I be? And you can see that I just solved that. But after I know the answer to how healthy do I want to be, I can ask how many health inputs should I buy? And after I've asked how many health inputs should I buy, I can answer how much will they cost? How much consumption will I have to give up in order to achieve that? And finally, going back in quadrant four, how will those health costs affect my consumption opportunities? So I, I get to answer all of these questions with the four quadrants. So let me build the four quadrant diagram again, consumption and health and health inputs and consumption on the bottom. Let's start with the, the various pieces of the model. We've got the production function, the budget constraint, the 45 degree line, and the production possibility frontier. And let's answer question one again. How healthy do I want to be? Go to point A. Okay, we've answered question one. Now what? Well, the next thing to do is to move that over to quadrant two. So let me quickly get over to quadrant two with my point A. And here I have a uh, arrow pointing away from point A into quadrant two into the production function. And you can see that where that horizontal dotted line is hitting the blue production function, 
that's how healthy I'm going to be. So I drop down from the production function and I get a point of intersection on this number of health inputs. I keep going down to the red line and I get a, uh, I hit the red line and I turn back into the consumption axis and now I know that in order to acquire those health inputs at those prices that's how much consumption I'll have. And I hit the 45 degree line and I hit back and everything works out in balance. So now let's talk about a reduction in income from point A to point A prime. Let's suppose this society that used to be on this brown curve has a catastrophe and something bad happens there that has diminished their ability to be healthy and it has diminished their ability to have consumption. Let's say they had a coronavirus epidemic. This would reduce their ability to achieve health and it would reduce their ability to make goods and services. If that happens to them, the budget line in the top right has gone down from the brown place to the, the red dotted line. They can no longer achieve point A. The best indifference curve they can achieve now is A prime. So that's a problem for them that they're, they're not as having as much utility anymore. What else is changing about the quadrant? Before we send them around the quadrant, they've had a reduction in their income. So it's going to show up not just in quadrant one. If we hit income, think about what else is going to go down. Will production go down? No. Their ability to assemble health out of drugs and services is the same. Uh, and so unless I stipulate that something terrible happened to the ability to make a person healthy using vitamins and broccoli, I didn't. I think that's generally the same. The blue curve is going to stay the same. Uh, if we tell you more and we say that the pill stopped working, the vaccine stopped working, production stopped, everybody was just dropping dead, then something different. But the blue curve still makes you healthy. But what does change, obviously, is their production opportunities here in the quadrant three. They can no longer uh, achieve this amount of uh, combinations of consumption and health inputs, and those have been reduced. Now that we've redrawn their budget constraints, accordingly, we can start the process of going around the loop. We start from A prime, we hit the blue curve at this new point that's been reduced, they will produce less health on the blue curve. They will drop down to the red curve in the quadrant three and you'll see that they will require less health inputs. They don't need as many drugs and pills because they can't afford them and they've decided they can't produce as much health because they don't have the money to be that healthy anymore. And so from the quadrant three, we reflect back and we've had a reduction in both health and consumption. We've also had a reduction in the demand for all healthcare services because of the reduction in the economy. People just can't pay their health bills in this exercise. So now let's model a case where there's been improved health technology only. Supposing I take this blue curve and I say, you know, this blue curve just got better. Somebody improved the quality of aspirin or they've invented a new health technology. So for every dollar you give a doctor now, they make you 10% healthier. The doctors are just smarter in this country. They have higher quality. And if we've improved the blue curve, think about it briefly. And then before I tell you what happens, if we make health technology better, what might happen to the other curves? Will this production possibilities curve stay this way? And will this health input uh, price curve stay the same way? Well, you're right. Uh, if we've made health technology more efficient, we can improve the point where the production possibility frontier lives uh, and intersects the vertical axis. It will no longer hit here but it'll hit a lot higher. We can now transform consumption opportunities into more health because this health technology has come on board and made our doctors uh, and nurses smarter and they make us healthier, even though we give them the, the same amount of money. So we'll do that as a homework exercise, but I wanted to, you to think about it. Also think about, you know, what if health technology becomes 10% better and you can get healthier with the same amount of money good question, right? What will happen in quadrant three? Will the doctors and nurses charge you more for the better health? Or will they say, look, well, it's the same hour as an hour, uh, even though my patient got healthier, I'll still charge you the same. Let's talk about that uh, at another time. 
it's worth pondering whether or not they will price in and keep you uh, on a treadmill, always paying them more for every, every extra bit of health they give you. So this is the basic introduction to the Grossman model of health demand, and I, I hope you enjoy it. We're going to talk about uh, what it, it implies and what its predictions are in part two when we talk about the marginal efficiency of capital.